So we have now a set of another three wonderful speakers. We had a fourth speaker scheduled, uh, Dr. Catherine Dodd. Unfortunately, uh, Dr. Dodd, who taught nursing also on her own campus, but she was also involved uh, being one of the leading uh, administrators under uh, Mayor Gavin Newsom. She's not able to be with us today. She has an emergency with her dog, taking her dog to the veterinarian. But we have three um, wonderful activists and, and leaders. Um, Cindy Russell will be our first speaker. She's the executive director of Physicians for Safe Technology. And uh, Cindy will tell you a little more about herself. Our second speaker is uh, Theodora Scarato. She's the executive director of the Environmental Health Trust. And please, Theodora, tell us more about the Environmental Health Trust when you get your moment in the sun. Uh, there's so much that you're doing that I think uh, everyone here wants to know about. And uh, our third presenter is Ellie Marks. She's the executive director of the California Brain Tumor Association. Um, each, of you had, each of you have had very unique lives to lead you to this point, so please add more than my brief introductions. And welcome to you all. Cindy, uh, Dr. Cindy uh, Russell will be our first speaker. All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Cindy Russell, as you said, Executive Director of Physicians for Safe Technology. And um, I wanna thank Ken and Amber for organizing this really important event. And I also have enjoyed listening to the speakers and will continue to, en to enjoy listening to the speakers. Um, I'm a plastic surgeon trained at Stanford and uh, went into practice uh, you know, uh, close by and <clears throat> became involved in environmental issues uh, when I joined the uh, Environmental Health Committee of our local county medical association. And we started looking at all the toxins in the environment those in Silicon Valley and beyond. Uh, we looked at fracking and uh, flame retardants and plastics and pesticides and a number of bioaccumulative toxins. And um, at this time I learned about um, these that persisted in, in breast milk. And as I have been in practice for over 20 years now, I've witnessed the epidemic of breast cancer and this uh, piqued my interest more. So. I did a lot of uh, work on policy through the CMA on toxins and setting policy. Um, and what I learned was that toxic exposures affect our health, um, as many of you really understand, and that um, we get exposed to many toxins at the same time. They can be cumulative in terms of the harm. Um, there are vulnerable populations uh, that are more susceptible, including pregnant women, children, those um, who are elderly or have chronic illness, and genetics and nutrition play a part in it. And we just get exposed to a whole, a whole um, soup of toxins every day. And what we have found out is that toxic exposures cause disease. Everybody's aware of that, um, but there's a lot of good literature out there associated with cancer, reproductive failure, brain dysfunction, autoimmune disease, developmental abnormalities. And it's interesting, they have said for many years, we have about 80,000 chemicals that we're exposed to. They updated the inventory um, uh, recently and said it's about 40,000 chemicals. However, most of those still haven't been studied for toxicity. And how many do you think have been banned? That's the key, how many have been banned? Uh, well, if you look at uh, REACH, which is the European program, they look at toxicity versus um, the need for that chemical, and they banned about 1,300 chemicals, including those in cosmetics. In the United States, it's, it's about 10 that have been banned or restricted. So we haven't done a very good job with chemicals, have we? Um, regulation and so forth. So what about cell towers? How did I get involved in this? Well, um, they wanted to put a, a cell tower in my daughter's school about 10 years ago. And at that point, I was deep into toxins, but had no idea that there could be any health effects. And we researched this a bit. Several parents were concerned about it. And we found that indeed, uh, people who live near cell towers, there were some good studies that showed that they had all these unusual symptoms. They had headaches, insomnia, fatigue, memory loss, and depression. Um, and so we convinced the school board that it wasn't a good idea to do it. And that was mostly due to the fact that a lot of parents were very angry after they learned about these issues and the boardroom was packed. And they said, we're not gonna give you any money to the foundation if you do this and you're gonna lose money in the long run. That small amount of money you're gonna to get to put that cell tower isn't really gonna be worth it. But it did um, pique my interest and I dove into the research since that time. 
I found out that radio frequencies are a biologic, they're an environmental toxin. Just like chemicals, you can't see them, it can't feel it, unless you are electrosensitive. But there is damage on a cellular level, and also there's broad effects on all living beings. Again, the damage can be cumulative, and we know that cancer takes decades. And also, these, uh, this technology was introduced and commercialized without adequate testing and certainly adequate regulation. So how does it work? If you read um, a lot of the headlines, they go, wow, radio frequency has never been shown to have any effects. There's just no mechanism. This radio frequency radiation is what we call non-ionizing. It's not ionizing like uh, radiation from an X-ray or nuclear uh, waste and so forth. Uh, how can it possibly damage um, a cell? Well, the mechanism, one of the mechanisms, there actually are several, but one of the major mechanisms is called reactive oxygen species creation. And this is actually the same um, mechanism of harm of toxic chemicals, which of course do not create heat, right? Don't create heat, but they're still toxic. And what these reactive oxygen species are is a normal, it's actually a normal response um, in our bodies and it helps in metabolism and it's a response to invading pathogens. When these are created, they serve as signaling molecules and they also signal gene expression. But if there's an excess of these reactive oxygen species, they're like hydrogen peroxide and so forth, there's an imbalance in our, our oxidant defense mechanism and this leads to the oxidative stress and that oxidative stress leads to damage to critical cellular macromolecules, which we're gonna talk about briefly, sorry. Antioxidants reverse this, um, vitamin C and E that we take in, those are good for us because they, they help to reverse and prevent the damage from these reactive oxygen species. Glutathione, melatonin, superoxide dismutase, those are actually our own internal antioxidants. So they see there is damage to cellular molecules. The DNA, there's fats, um, there's membrane injury, there's protein damage. Yakimenko in 2016 found um, that of 100 studies, 93 of those showed oxidation, and there's even more now. Where is there oxidation? There's damage to cell structures, sperm, ovaries, nerve cells, cardiac cells, blood cells, immune cells. And again, there are dozens of studies that are showing that antioxidants reverse the effects. We have these studies on our website, and there's others that have these. We have them fairly accessible if you go to mdsafetech.org, and you can find under mechanism of action, um, oxidation studies, and you can have links to these. Um, it's quite alarming when you actually start looking into it because you really, if you've not had any idea, it's, it, it's amazing. Um, and also because they say there's no, there's no studies. So what do we know about oxidation stress? Oxidation stress leads to inflammation and that leads to human disease. And um, the same as with chemicals in the environment, a wireless does the same thing. And the human disease that is, um, asso it is associated with are all those diseases of our modern, our modern society. And that includes cancer, reproductive harm, neurologic dysfunction, Alzheimer's disease, cardiac disease, immune suppression. And in fact, in 2019, um, the NIH had a whole conference on cancer and inflammation. So we know that it leads to disease, inflammation does. So just briefly about radio frequency and microwave radiation, what do we know? Um, not hard to figure out, we're electrical beings, so that's where our heart works, that's how our brain works, our nervous system works that way, and also our endocrine systems, which are all connected, it's really important. This radiation doesn't stop at the skin, it passes through our bodies. This, this is the current radiation, which is the 4G, uh, longer wavelengths, they pass through our body, they pass through organisms, and along the way they're absorbed by anything that contains water. Um, and as we know now, uh, the radiation can interfere with uh, cellular biologic processes, uh, not through heat, it's not a heat mechanism. And we don't get exposed to just one frequency, we get exposed to a mix of frequencies. If you think about your cell phone has four antennas and those have different frequencies, your GPS, your Bluetooth, your Wi-Fi, your cellular, I'm going to just briefly discuss, there's not a lot of time because this could go, uh, talk could go on and on. Um, just some studies. Uh, let's look at uh, briefly at brain, brain effects. In 1981, NASA uh, uh, started to, to um, describe microwave illness in radar workers, those who are around a lot of electrical equipment, and they showed these so same signs as those who were near cell towers. Uh, they had headaches, irritability, fatigue, 
they couldn't sleep, they had nervous tension, depression, um, they lost their hair, had uh, breathing difficulties and, and memory impairment. Well, more recently, firefighters have found the same thing. And uh, when firefighters had first responder cell towers placed, they had the same kind of symptoms and they were tired, they couldn't sleep, they had anger, depression. Firefighters were reported on 911 calls and they got lost in the city that they grew up in. They forgot CPR. Um, and because of this, the International Association of Firefighters in 2004, they actually commissioned a study to look at brain effects. And what they found was an indication that there was brain injury or trauma that was consistent with this uh, um, cell phone radiation and uh, they lobbied to have cell towers removed from their fire, uh, fire stations. And this is actually coded now in AB 57 in California. So these are symptoms of electrosensitivity. I, uh, when I first started looking at it, you know, we, we knew about all these um, symptoms of headaches and so forth. Um, but I looked at the literature and the literature said, no, these symptoms are really all in your head. They're psychiatric. There's no real basis for this. We now know this wrong. There are actually biomarkers you can look at. Bell Palm's done these studies. Um, but I spoke with Dr. Scott Everly. He's on our advisory board and uh, he wrote a wonderful article I recommend to everybody read who is in doubt about this. It's called, What's the Diagnosis, Doctor? You can find it online. You can find it on our mbsafetech.org. He also wrote another uh, article called An Underworld Journey. And he described his experience uh, becoming electrosensitive after a um, carbon monoxide poisoning. And then he became very sensitive to electrical equipment. I mean, all these um, devices, his computer, cell phone, and so forth. And he had to deal with this and learn how to deal with this and change some things. Um, but he's a very respectable doctor and he's a wonderful writer. And he talks also about the psychological problems. And I think this is where some people um, can help me understand why some of these can lead to sort of almost a post-traumatic stress disorder uh, because these symptoms are so severe in people. So Bevington in 19, uh, I mean in 2018, he uh, looked at a review of reviews on electrohypersensitivity and he found many people are disabled, they can't work. About 5% of people have moderate electrosensitivity and about 0.65 have restricted access to work. That is about, and he said in the UK, about 435,000 people in the UK are restricted to work. In the United States, I think I calculated it out to be a couple million or something. Um, but it's a real serious problem. Well, let's look at the literature. If you look at the literature, you'll find that wireless radiation is neurotoxic. If you look at the literature and the rat studies, they haven't done human studies yet, there's loss of brain cells in the hippocampus. The hippocampus is our memory center. That's how we have long-term storage of memory. There's demyelination of nerve cells, similar to what's seen in multiple sclerosis. There's decrease in neurotransmitter levels, disruption of the blood-brain barrier, DNA damage. All those are you can find on the website. And we need more studies, but there's really a great indication of harm here. If you look at some of the clinical studies where they've done epidemiologic studies on memory behavior, where they've looked at thousands of people, um, they showed a definite association with higher radio frequency levels and um, ADHD in uh, mother-child pairs where the kids were born and they followed them. Um, Dr. Lee studied them, followed them over 20 years. Um, and Burks uh, have studied this as well. And uh, memory problems in Forrester, looking at 22 schools, decreased memory scores, and also speech delay. What about those who are internet addicted? I think Dr. Um, Dunkley's gonna talk about this a little bit later, but if you look at this, uh, there's a lot of people who are internet addicted, and the radiologist and the um, psychiatrist got together and they wanted to find out what it was doing to brain cells. So there's four good studies that have shown there's impaired white matter, there's shrinkage of the gray matter. The longer they're addicted, um, the more severe the structural brain damage. And um, they did a study in college kids and they, they showed the same thing with mobile phone overuse, that there was structural brain changes. In China, they have about 25 million kids who are addicted to phones and they've set up over 250 camps to treat these kids and they put them basically in isolation. They take away all the tech and they say, you're gonna read a book. And apparently it's been successful. So um, children are more vulnerable. Um, um, EH Trust talked a lot about this. Uh, skulls are thinner, higher content of water in the brain. There's more absorption and their organ systems are not developed. They have to be especially careful with all of these radio frequency exposures in children. What about reproduction? Well, on our side, I counted uh, today 54 studies um, they show, show structural alteration of the sperm, decreased motility, decreased testosterone, DNA damage. There's ovarian damage, and you can have aging of the ovaries, and the same oxidative 
damage in ovaries with uh, radiofrequency radiation, embryo damage and miscarriage. Dr. Ali did this wonderful study um, that nobody's refuted on wireless devices and miscarriage. He looked at 913 pregnant women. He's, he published this in 2017, and he uh, put monitors on them. Um, they call them exposometers, and he measured the EMF and said, just have an average day, and in just, just regular, environmentally relevant, what we're exposed to every day, he found a threefold increase in miscarriage in the highest group, the highest group that, of uh, exposure and published it. It was a real eye-opener. A lot of people who thought it was everything was hokey falokey with wireless radiation, they started just, their eyes were opened. So what about cancer? Um, the IR classifies this as a possibly carcinogenic, a class 2B. There are many esteemed scientists who think that there's enough evidence of cancer that this should be a known carcinogen or a class 1. Uh, and there's information on our site and others. A uh, good study that um, was completed in 2018 called the National Toxicology Study on Cell Phones and Cancer it was 10 years, $25 million. And they concluded that there was a significant association with cancer of the heart, brain, adrenal medulla, and prostate, a clear evidence of, the, of cancer of the heart. And also they found an unusual thing, which is cardiomyopathy or aging of the heart, again, speaking to oxidation of the heart as this radiation passes through us. This study, um, was covered in the media initially well, and then people have discredited it. And um, um, it's just a real difficult thing to get people to really look at this. This is a wonderful study that was done. Just a few things on brain cancer and cell phones. Ellie may uh, discuss this, but brain tumors are rising in England and France. Hardell and Carlberg have been uh, real leaders in terms of looking at the association of brain tumors and cell phone use on the same side of the head and point out that the cordless phone that you use is a cell phone and has almost the same radiation and you get a base station radiation as well. But after about 2000 hours of cell phone use, your risk goes up. And that's not very much if you look at your uh, cell phone bills, it's not very much. The Interphone study, which was touted as the best study around, and this was started before many people really used the cell phones, found an increase in brain tumors in the highest user group after 10 years. And this speaks to the fact that we haven't used this technology for long enough to really understand the true risks of long-term um, radiation. Uh, Industry-funded fu studies are flawed, and the fir first court case on cell phones and cancer was won in Italy in 2017. Why? Because they threw out the industry-funded studies. Ellie might mention it. She's shaking her head. Um, brain tumor ra rates are rising in France, and this um, is a graph between 1990 and 2015 that was recently put out. Um, so there are increases. And again, there may be flaws in how and reporting and how this is done. Brain cancer is rising in youth. It's the most common cancer, age zero to 14. Um, there's an increase in those who are age less than 30. There's evidence of this in INSCEEP studies, um, and about 5,000 children and adolescents are diagnosed each year. It's, a very, it's, it's not really a very curable disease. What about the standards? Aren't they protective? They must be protective. Well, um, you're gonna hear a lot about it from others. Um, but FCC standards are outdated. It's a cooking standard. It's based on heat, a short-term heat, not on long-term biological effects. It's a huge fight. We need to reevaluate the safety standards. They don't consider any of the vulnerable populations, fetus, babies, elderly, those with chronic illness. They don't consider those who are electrosensitive. And again, they only consider thermal effects, not non-thermal effects that have been seen in literature, have been um, wonderfully categorized by BioInitiative, who initially was the big leader in this, and they still are a leader in promoting this. FCC standards need re-evaluation, and um, many people have called for re-evaluation of safety standards that are, are reputable. Think about how many wireless devices you have now, you know. Um, used to be we just had a cell phone, and now everything's wireless. You got your Nest, everything's connected, you're connected all the time. And, you know, it's, it's not just the devices, but now we've got more cell towers around. And now, now we've got virtual reality. We've got those radiating devices very close to our eyes, uh, very close to um, parts we love. So, you know, what about our exposures? This is a, a wonderful graphic by um, Dr. Phillips who, if you look at it, the green is the natural background in 1920. It was mostly much lower frequencies, radio frequencies and so forth. But with time in the 1950s and 1980s, you can see going from 
yellow to orange to red. Now the red is really mostly the higher frequencies that we're exposed to in Wi-Fi range, cell phone, Wi-Fi, and they're reaching pretty high levels because that line horizontally that you see above there is the, the ICNIRP guidelines. So, um, and I think they want to expand those as well. So this is, um, we need to flatten this curve of exposure just like we do with COVID. This exposure is just getting too high. But while we should be curbing it, what are we doing? We've got the race to 5G and um, we're gonna move fast and we're gonna break things, aren't we? I think we are. Um, health risks are there. There's, eye, there's evidence in the literature that there's eye damage, skin injury, bacteria resistance, and also there could be really widespread metabolic disturbance. Um, but unfortunately, um, unfortunately, uh, this, you know, I'm sorry, I'm seeing other things here. Um, this isn't actually tested very well, um, as we are, we're going to find out. There's other risks to 5G, privacy, security, liability, climate change. It's going to be huge in terms of energy consumption, loss of critical landlines. Um, and how is this going to all end up as we're pushing it? Maybe like the challenger on the upper right corner. I don't know. Uh, exposure to wireless radiation. Is there a test going on? Indeed, there is. And we are all part of it without any controls. There's no monitoring. There's no health studies. There's no health surveys before they put cell towers in. There's no safety tests. Dr. Blumenthal brought this up at a Senate committee meeting. And, um, and you know what? He said, an industry said, yeah, we don't have any ongoing studies of 5G. No problem. It's no problem because, you know, we can count on industry to do it. They've done it before. Tobacco, asbestos, lead, flame retardants, plastics, all number of things um, that have been inadequately tested and inad inadequately regulated. We've got nanoparticles now and all sorts of things. We need bio, bio, um, biologically based exposure limits, as Bioinitiative Report points out, they're much higher. Uh, we need them thousands of times lower. And you can go to Bioinitiative to look at this. Wireless safety tips, we have some on our website. Other people have them on their website just to tell you, you need to get wired again, just like we used to. It's pretty easy. We got wired in our house. Uh, you need to reduce your exposure. That's all we can do right now. Uh, you wanna turn your wireless devices off and your Wi-Fi off at night. Time matters, distant matters. You wanna use them less and keep them farther away. You wanna keep your landline and you wanna remove your smart meter is what advice I would give. Here's some articles that I've written on this and 5G wireless telecommunications expansion. You can find it on our website. I wanna thank you for this. I know it was a quick talk. <laughs> Just reduce your exposure again. And um, we want a world that is gonna be with technology, but safe for humans. We want it safe for nature and we want it safe for our communities. Thank you. So I am executive director of Environmental Health Trust and we are a, a, a scientific think tank. We publish research, we educate policymakers, collaborate with a lot of the people who are presenting today. Um, and we also raise awareness with educational programs which we hope will, will, you know, people will use, and I'll share some of those resources with you. We have a YouTube channel, we have um, co scientific conferences we put on regularly, and so please uh, check out our resources at ehtrust.org. Now let's see if I can, okay, good. And um, uh, this is our pamphlet, just about more of the work that we do. I'm really honored to be working with um, some of the leading scientists who are publishing in this field. And here are some resources that we have, folders, um, flyers you can download, safety cards, posters, etc. So we are told to binge on and at the same time sold how to decrease our use. This is T-Mobile's, you know, how to give them time to disconnect because of course companies are fully aware and society and all of us are becoming more aware that they are fully aware and have been about the addictive qualities of this technology. But what we're often not told about is the infrastructure for 5G and the devices of 5G, which is the internet of things and the billions of new devices that are coming with this next generation of technology. Um, here are some examples. This is when I was in San Francisco, the second picture of a small cell. And by the way, small cell is an industry created word. Uh, instead of saying cell towers, the word is termed small cell. 
which really microwave antenna is close to us. And here it is right near um, where I was staying in San Francisco. This was sent to me by someone who asked, should I be concerned? We are, our organization is sent pictures like this on a regular basis, people waking up to this issue, uh, asking questions, never heard of it before and saying, wait, what's going on here and, and should I be concerned or I'm having symptoms, um, what's, tell me more. Well, internationally, there is a lot going on. And, and one thing that we do at, at Environmental Health Trust is track the actions around the world on this. So in, in Italy, there are now 260 municipalities who have passed resolutions or uh, calls or appeals um, where the elected officials are saying, we do not want 5G until you can show us safety. Um, and this is a mayor, um, uh, a one of the latest news stories. And every time I check in with the Italian group, the number is just increasing. So they are raising awareness at a rapid rate over there, just talking about this issue and having the community vote. I wanted to share with you this video, oh, I didn't mean for it to start, um, of the protests that are actually happening around the world as people wake up to this. This is Amsterdam. Um, they're uh, all around the world, Australia, California, and in all cities all across the United States, Belgium, South Africa, Italy, Australia, New Zealand, Greece, Cyprus, uh, Spain, and Isle, Isle of Wight. Now, what are the reasons that there has been so much uh, action and organization in other countries is that other countries actually have stricter limits about how much radiation cell towers can create environmentally, like as you're walking down the street. Um, and the United States and Japan, Australia actually allow among the highest levels of uh, cell tower network radiation. So in those countries that have, and this doesn't have all the countries, it's several countries in Europe, uh, Poland, Italy, um, Switzerland, uh, they are being asked by companies to increase their allowable levels in order to deploy 5G. And communities are saying, well, we don't want that. We, we like our limits. They are more protective because of all of the research, which Dr. Russell talked about. And industry actually, and I did a webinar on this. Um, I have several webinars on 5G. They are spending millions in order to get countries to change their laws to allow more radiation to facilitate 5G and the internet of things. This is Juhi Chala. She um, is uh, an actress and also uh, raises social awareness on this issue in India. And she received the Indira Gandhi Memorial uh, Award for her work in raising awareness about cell tower radiation. And I'm just gonna play literally five seconds because I hope that you will go and watch her full uh, speech online. We wouldn't want that 20 years down the line, we have an an entire population of young children, young adults, old, suffering from various health effects due to our negligence, our inaction, or our ignorance. And um, her story is that she looked outside her window and noticed there were all these antennas facing her, her flat and started looking into it uh, and uh, said, wait, <laughs> something's gotta be done. And because of her, because uh, she's a public figure, actually she was able to get those antennas down pretty quickly because of all the, the press that she received. However, that is of course not the case in, in many communities. Um, so I just wanted to briefly, I, I talked somewhat about this, but there, in addition to Italy, there are cities in California, which I know Ellie is gonna talk about connecting with those organizations 
who have passed ordinances to uh, restrict where these, these shorter cell towers go to protect neighborhoods. Um, there are many countries like uh, where they're halting the 5G rollout, like Slovenia, um, we just heard Nigeria, um, Brussels, Belgium, where they're saying, first, we want to do, uh, we need to know about the safety first. Now, unfortunately, in some of those countries, that becomes a, a charade where there are reports done by industry connected groups that say there is no proof of established harm. It is not proven that it is harmful, even though all of these studies exist. And even though all there are hundreds of scientists calling to halt the rollout. Um, and so on U United Kingdom, uh, Ireland, we have a page on our website to track as much as possible uh, who's doing what, where we have different countries and what's happening around the world. Um, and I've given talks on this and I, I would love to, um, you can find some of it online, but it, it's not just about the, the radiation exposure because pollution and environmental destruction and disregard for human and environmental rights is happening at every stage of the life cycle of a digital device. I mean, everything from the conflict and the minerals, the raw minerals used in our devices to the worker conditions. I don't know if you can see in that picture, um, those are the suicide nets put up at Foxconn because of the, and, and they were making parts for Apple because of the inhumane working conditions within the building. Um, toxins in manufacturing, there's a movie called Complicit uh, that talks about the, the poisoning of these young workers with the chemicals that are washing the parts. Um, of course, addiction and radiation exposure to uh, the, the users of the devices. And then there's the lack of recycling, um, which is actually informal, informal recycling practices are polluting communities with lead and the other toxic minerals. And then of course, e-waste. Um, there is a, this is an environmental justice issue with disproportionate impacts. Um, communities who are exposed to higher concentrations of air, food, water, pollutants at work, home, and school are going to have different impacts. There's research showing synergistic effects where you combine uh, electromagnetic fields with a toxic exposure. The outcome is much higher than if it was just the known toxin. There are occupational exposures, delivery workers, service industry, maintenance, where people really have no choice about the technology that they need to use in their job, and they certainly can't easily switch jobs. Um, and there's a lack of awareness, not being informed, and a lack of accessible and safe alternatives uh, to this technology that are available. And of course, the financial issue, it costs money to buy some of the things you might need, like an adapter, like ethernet cords, all of these things, which are um, some of us take for granted. Um, but but limit the ability of people to address this um, in their homes. And then of course disparities in healthcare access and treatment will further exacerbate the outcomes. I wanted to show you, however, what uh, what French Polynesia is doing. They educate their community. Here is a 30 second video they have uh, with the different sources of electromagnetic fields in the home. Uh, and they actually have a flyer and this wonderful two pages on how to reduce exposure. There are over 20 countries that educate their, their, um, the public about how to reduce and they say you should reduce exposure. They don't say maybe you should, uh, but you should. 5G as well as electromagnetic fields are rated as a high uh, risk by insurance authorities. This is the Swiss Re report. We have a website, a uh, web page on our site that lists all of these reports. If insurance companies won't take the risk, why should we? In addition, companies inform their shareholders that there could be a risk to, um, there are potential risks to their financial uh, health of their, of their company if, if harm is found. And of course, insurance companies will not insure people, uh, insure for 
electromagnetic fields. Um, I need a time because I don't have a timer on this. How many more minutes do I have left? Just to check in, I apologize. Okay, good, six, okay, that's perfect. Um, this is, in Cyprus, this is the back of a bus. They have a public education campaign with several, the Ministry of Health, the Committee on Environment and Children's Health. And if you see the translation of what this public bus is saying, it's don't irradiate me, learn how to protect me. And they have uh, videos for different uh, pregnant women, for teens, for uh, parents on how to reduce exposure to cell phone radiation. And they say, again, we recommend that you reduce exposure. In Archbishop Macaria's hospital in Cyprus, they have replaced the Wi-Fi with Ethernet in the pediatric units uh, as a test. To st and they even did measurements before and after confirming that the radiation was decreased for the, uh, the, the, the little babies uh, born, born early. Um, and here's just some of the, the copy and, and what they share with parents. They're educating parents about how to reduce exposure. I know Ellie Marks is gonna talk more about this. Um, this is from Korea where they have videos on keeping the phone away from your head. Uh, this is actually a, a screen save from one of their videos by the, the Korean um, you know, government agency. Whereas in the United States, uh, the FCC is refusing to change the way phones are tested, which is with a separation distance. They are not tested touching your body. They are tested at a distance. And what, what happens, it's kind of like diesel gate where the radiation levels that are absorbed into your body actually exceed FCC limits. The FCC is also refusing to update their limits on radio frequency, which are outdated not even based on protecting children or for long-term or really any of us. And I have a quote here from the FCC just recently in 2019 with an action where they said, we are not gonna update our limits. We are not gonna change the way we test phones. And they, they say uh, that testing with zero spacing against the body is unnecessary. And here I have pictures, one from when I was at the beach with a man who had the phone on his chest, which of course I used to do before I learned about this. Um, man on the bus just finding a place for his phone um, and of course children who are handed phones as toys um, and parents are completely unaware uh, of the health implications. Now the National Toxicology Program does say on their website in a Q&A that you can find at the NTP page it says have you changed your cell phone use or what you recommend to your family? And it says, NTP scientists have become more aware of their usage and follow the FDA tips for reducing exposure to cell phone radiation. They reduce the time spent on the cell phone and use speaker mode to keep a distance from the device. Um, and this um, is just a, a map showing a few of the laws that are passed around the world so everything from Belgium banning cell phones designed for young children. And I, ha um, I have all of this in a packet, which I'll share with you and you can download and just learn more about this. It's absolutely incredible and shows how far we, the United States need to go to catch up. New Hampshire has a commission to study the health and environmental effects of 5G. They have uh, incredible ex notes on everything that they've done, and I recommend taking a look at that. There's actually other countries that are looking into 5G. Um, Oregon passed a bill about looking at wireless exposure to children. I uh, just want to touch on bees. This is a study that looked at the higher frequencies, which are going to be used in 5G, and how do bees absorb them? Because there's human health and then the natural environment. Well, it turns out that the higher frequencies resonate uh, with insects and smaller, uh, smaller, the, the sm small insects. And the researchers are warning that this could impact their behavior. This is an important study. It is the first study that has been done. And the question that I asked when I saw that was, how could this be the first study? They're rolling it out. And this is the first study and, and they're warning, they're saying there is a problem. Well, of course, if you're gonna put all of this 
new frequencies in the air and untested. Um, and then of course we have trees. Uh, everything from trimming trees for the infrastructure. And this is a clip from a news report where the company said, we needed to deliver a better service to our customers and we also wanted to make the trees safe. Um, and, you know, uh, the trees are being sacrificed to put up all of this new infrastructure. We're talking about actually about millions of new antennas and over 800,000 new cell towers in the United States alone. There's research showing radio frequency injures trees. And here's a study that, looked, that followed trees for years that were in the line of sight of an antenna. We have all of this on our website. As Dr. Russell mentioned, climate change, the increased energy consumption. There are uh, climate change think tanks who are talking about the implications of all of this new equipment and what it will mean. So please learn more at Environmental Health Trust and I'll send you some materials. We do webinars, we educate, we give um, high level policy talks and we also, I love to talk to college students and uh, just educate the world on this issue. So thank you so much. And Ellie Marks, welcome. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> Would rather see you in person, but. <laughs> <laughs> soon, I hope, I hope. Yes, soon. Yeah. So I wanna thank Professor Burroughs and Amber for arranging this um, and not allowing the pandemic to stop it. Um, as Mickey said earlier, it is ironic that today is the international 5G protest and we are using technology to communicate. So we are not against technology as it indeed helps in so many ways, but we are for safe technology, including wired broadband into our homes, our schools and our workplaces. So I wanna thank Dr. Russell and Theodora, amazing, brilliant. Um, you covered so much about 5G, about the science, about the corruption. Um, but I'm here today mostly to talk to you about this thing, our cell phones. Um, and that's why I'm wearing this very fashionable t-shirt that EHT actually made, Environmental Health Trust. And it says, cannot call it a smartphone if it kills brain cells. So I'd like to talk to you more about that. Um, 12 years ago next week, my husband was diagnosed with a brain tumor. And shortly thereafter, we started hearing about Ted Kennedy, who was diagnosed at the same time, and his family felt that it was his cell phone that may have caused his brain tumor. My husband was a fairly heavy long-term cell phone user. So I reached out to doctors and scientists all over the world, and they confirmed what I thought could be the truth, that his tumor, being that it was on the side of the head where he held his phone and he used the phone often, and the type of tumor, the glioma, um, was more likely than not the result of his long-term cell phone use. Um, since testifying to Congress on this and appearing on many TV shows, many others started reaching out to me. And this started in about 2008, and it's incredible how many, and sad, how many people I've heard from some who are no longer with us, some that are very young. Many of us are um, suing the telecom industry, the carriers and manufacturers of the equipment my husband used and others. And those cases are in the DC courts right now. They're very, very slow and very, very difficult, even though we have the proof. Um, so those people did not have the right to know that holding the cell phone to their head or their body could cause them harm. Thus, many of us fight to give you that right. And college students now are the first generation to be exposed to wireless radiation, even while their mother was pregnant with them. So we are quite concerned. I doubt that any of them even know what a landline looks like. So we want cities across the nation or states would be great um, to post these warnings at the point of sale. Sadly, it gets very complicated as the industry doesn't want you to know that. And, and these messages are hidden in your phone or in the manual that no, nobody reads. I don't even know if you get a manual anymore. So we want that information to be at the point of sale, but the industry sues saying, no, we don't want it to be there. 
So I worked with San Francisco on this starting in about 2009. And Mayor Newsom was, then Mayor Newsom was great on this issue. And they passed, unanimously passed a cell phone right to no bill, which would put information at the point of sale. The industry immediately slapped a big lawsuit on them. They pulled their conventions out of San Francisco. It was miserable. But the lawsuit went on for about four years. Eventually, the city did repeal their law. It was a very sad thing for us. And there was some corruption involved with this, which I don't want to go public with. If anybody wants more information, I'll give you my email at the end for other stuff too. So the corruption, this industry infiltrates just about everywhere is what I'm trying to tell you. So, but here's the good news. We took it to Berkeley and they voted in, into law and the industry sued. However, we had Harvard constitutional law professor, Larry Lessig, defend Berkeley pro bono. And this lawsuit went on for a few years and just last December, it ended um, at the United States Supreme Court. The industry took it all the way to the United States Supreme Court twice and the court would not hear it. So Berkeley has prevailed and the posting is in retail stores in Berkeley. So this is good news because we wanna take this when the pandemic and the lockdown is over to other cities and states. Um, so San Francisco was going to introduce it again, Supervisor Gordon Marr, I think it was March 17th, but it was right when the pandemic caused the lockdown and it's been delayed, but we're thrilled this is going to be introduced and hopefully enacted. We need people's help in doing this. The only way we get things like this done is with people showing up, writing letters, and just supporting this, leg this important legislation. So we're going to use the cell phone right to know in San Francisco to help educate the current board of supervisors on the health effects of wireless radiation, including 5G and maybe even 6G, they need educating. And I will tell you more about that in a few minutes. Um, the California Department of Public Health, I think one of you touched on that, but I'll tell you a little bit more. They did their own science in 2009. They found that cell phones were indeed causing brain tumors. A friend of mine worked there and he told me that they were going to be issuing a cell phone guidance sheet, cell phone and health. And I waited impatiently and didn't see it. And after about six months, you know, I would ask him, where is it? Every few months I'd ask him, where is it? It was sitting on somebody's desk, it needed approval. And about three or four years later, I was very frustrated and I told somebody I work with quite often, Dr. Joel Moskowitz at UC Berkeley School of Public Health about it. He tried filing FOIAs and um, Public Records Acts and they stonewalled him and he sued. He, the legal department at UC Berkeley sued the state of California, the CDPH, and Joel won. However, they only had to release it to him. So it was suppressed. It was political appointees suppressing this document for almost eight years. So we rallied the troops, we protested, we had a great sign that said California Department of Telecom Health that we held up at one of their big, big parties on the steps of the Capitol. And they did release it. It was released to the public in 2017. However, I don't think too many people see it. This is it. And if anybody wants it, they can email me. It's cell phones and health. And they do tell you some good things on here. Um, they talk about cancers on the same side of the head where cell phones are held. And the chance of developing brain cancer if you hold the phone to the head is, is likely. Um, they talk about children. So it is a good document and we really need, and we have to thank Joel for his persistence on this. And we need to get this out to the public. We need to use this. So I want to tell you a little bit about an article some of you might have already read, but it's called How Big Wireless Made Us Think Cell Phones Are Safe, a Special Investigation. It's a wonderful article about two of the best investigative journalists in the United States, Mark Dowdy and Mark Hertzgard. And here is a quote from that article. Like their tobacco and fossil fuel brethren, wireless executives have chosen not to publicize what their own scientists have said about the risks of their products. On the contrary, the industry in America, Europe, and Asia has spent untold millions of dollars in the past 25 years 
proclaiming that science is on its side, that the critics are quacks, and the consumers have nothing to fear. This, even as the industry has worked behind the scenes, again like big tobacco, to deliberately addict its customers. Just as cigarette companies added nicotine to, nicotine to hook smokers, so have wireless companies designed cell phones to deliver a jolt of dopamine with each swipe of the screen. This is sad but true, and a couple of you have touched on addict addiction today. So it appears that the industry's goal is to addict us and make more, more and more money. By a college professor who felt that his students were addicted, disengaged, and distracted by their phones. So he asked his students to go cell-free for a while and write about it. So many wrote that not using a phone freed them from the burden of responding to texts, emails, and voicemail. One said, quote, I didn't need to hear the effing thing ring or vibrate, and I did not feel bad about not answering calls or texts because there were none there. Others said it was very hard not using it, and they felt they were indeed hooked. So I suggest that we all be mindful of this, myself included, and maybe give some thought to ways of cutting back, put them away during meals, things like that. Um, it might actually be fun and it might be less stressful and we certainly don't want to be addicted. So last but not least, how do we protect ourselves? How do you stay safe and still use a phone? Um, I mentioned landlines before. If you have a landline, keep it. Don't hold the phone to your head. The good news is that I don't think we see as many people holding the phone to their head now as we used to. Um, don't keep it on while it's on your body. This is really important because as the others have pointed out, this is not just about brain cancer. This is causing damage to fetuses, causing infertility and cancers all over the body. We have people who have um, breast cancer, kept their cell phones in their bras, testicular cancer. So, and miscarriages that Dr. Russell talked about. So don't keep it on while it's on your body. Please put it in airplane mode. I know it's inconvenient because you won't get a call, but check it every so often if you have to. Um, I think a lot of you text, which is great, or use the speaker, but keep the phone away from you. Don't put it on your lap when you're, doing, when you're texting. Um, try not to stream live on your phone. Download whenever possible. Don't sleep with your phone. Um, if you have to use it as your alarm clock, put it in airplane mode. So don't, don't keep it too close to you when it, at night, especially it'll disturb your sleep and the signal is going right through your body all night long. Um, use wired headsets like I have on. I noticed a couple other people did today. They have the air tube up here. If you don't know where to get them again, I will give you my email and I can help you with that. So I think that's about it. Um, and Catherine, unfortunately, couldn't be here. So Ken, I guess we're going to move on to the 5G portion. 5G, I don't know how, if all of you know this. It's a very high frequency millimeter wave. And because of that, it doesn't travel far. So it has to be put every, I think it's every three to eight homes in every community in, you know, for us to download quicker and all that. So it's being placed in front of homes like Theodora showed you some of the pictures. And this is very serious. So San Francisco, unfortunately, is not as progressive as they used to be. It's a new board of supervisors. They passed a wireless facility ordinance that is not protective of residents, and it's going to allow nearly 1,200 5G antennas in the city. So this needs to be repealed, and we need your help to do this. The only way we can get it done is if people write, people show up at the meeting. So I can let you know more about that. Um, once the pandemic quiet downs, we plan to use the right to know legislation, which I told you about, to raise awareness strategically around San Francisco. So simultaneously, we'll continue to work to overturn 190-19, the telecom ordinance I told you about, that they pushed through the Board of Supervisors last July. And we will need lots of you to help us lobby on that. Um, so that's what's happening in San Francisco, unfortunately. But many cities are in California are working with their residents to try to do this right, even though they feel that their hands are tied because of an FCC ruling that has taken away most local authority. Their hands are not tied. So places like Mill Valley, Davis, Burbank, Berkeley, Calabasas have done this. 
Some ordinances include having an RF energy en engineer actually test the emissions to make sure they're within the FCC guidelines. I listened to Andrew Campanelli, an attorney who specializes in this the other night. He said, sometimes they're a thousand percent over. And a lot of these antennas and the cumulative radiation from cell towers and small cells will be over. So if an RF engineer tests this and it's over, they can sue. And in Calabasas, um, down in Southern California, a citizen can actually do this and sue the owner of the antenna. Um, closer to home, Los Altos has a good ordinance as it keeps 5G out of residential neighborhoods. However, I talked to the a city council person the other day who was the mayor when this was enacted and they are being sued by Verizon and AT&T and she's fearful that her council might cave. They do have an attorney and I hope the attorney's good because I hate to see them give in to this lawsuit. Unfortunately, this is happening in many places. Um, I just moved to Walnut Creek recently only to find out that during the lockdown, they approved 29 5G antennas. I find that despicable. So I'm working with the East Bay Neighborhoods for technology, wow. Responsible Technology now to hopefully educate them, the city council, and get them to rescind that vote. Obviously, they just don't get it or they're too friendly with the telecom industry. So a city still has the right to control the aesthetics of an installation. So if they make this difficult for telecom, they might walk away. Also, insurers such as Swiss RE and Lloyds of London will not insure for liability because the risk is too great. Telecom only insures up to 1 million. So many cities are including a strict liability clause in their ordinance, and this could send industry running. So another approach is for residents to educate their local officials on property value issues. A survey in Realtor Magazine showed that a large majority of homeowners or home buyers would not consider purchasing a property near a cell tower. So as you can see, we have our work cut out for us and we need your help. Um, progress is slow, but eventually we will get Congress to hold hearings on these issues. We're working on that now, many of us, and rake the telecom industry over the coals as they did with the tobacco giants many years ago. So I'd like to give you my email, and maybe I can put it in the chat. And please contact me if you want any, inf any further information. And thank you so much to all of you for letting me into your lives today, and please stay safe. Thank you.